All right. Welcome, everybody. It is the third Wednesday of every month, and welcome to our West Coast edition of the Kubernetes Office Hours. This is our monthly live stream. Sorry, had a bit of an echo there. This is our monthly live stream where we hop onto YouTube with a bunch of Kubernetes experts and try to answer as many of your user questions as possible. We've got tons of new volunteers and new people going. Um, so welcome, everybody. How's it sound there? Please let us know in hash office dash hours. Follow these instructions uh, if you're not on the Slack channel. And the Slack chat is available here on the side for you, those of you watching the live stream. Thanks for watching. If you're in the Slack channel, say hello. Let us know where you're from. We like to see stuff scrolling by all day when we say stuff. That's always our favorite. All right, before we begin, I'm going to kind of run, run down how this works for you here. This is a Kubernetes event, so the code of conduct is in effect. Please be excellent to each other. Um, before we start into the rules, let's get into some introductions. So we will go in this order here. Uh, who are you, where you work, what you do? Uh, I don't know, your favorite dinosaur, let's do that. Uh, the order will be Samuel Drala, Marky, Monica, Pierre, Jeremy, and Dave. Hey guys, good morning. This is Vamshi Samuel Drala. Uh, I work as senior infrastructure engineer at American Airlines. Uh, New to this community, pretty new. I mean, three to four months working with uh, open source, but uh, pretty much working with Kubernetes from past three years. And good to know the community and started working with, say, Contribix and really CI signal things and just hopping in. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Marky. Uh, this is my pair partner back here. Uh, I am a software engineer. I am a Kubernetes core contributor as well as part of the release team. And uh, I love to ask questions and make jokes. So honk everybody and welcome. Uh, my name is Monica. I am a site reliability engineer at VMware. Um, this is my first time on here. So uh, be nice. I'll do my best. Um, I have a like a ops background and infrastructure, so that's kind of my wheelhouse. Breaking Kubernetes is my favorite. So, hi, I'm Pierre. Um, I'm a software architect uh, working with distributed systems. Um, I'm working at Spectrum and uh, yeah, kind of new to the community as well, trying to help people and like this kind of the things that I do. Um, is it me next? All right, um, I'm Jeremy Rickard. I'm a software engineer at VMware as well. Um, my favorite dinosaur is a T-Rex. I like the little, the little arms. Um, I, uh, I'm also on SIG, uh, sorry, the release team, uh, the 118 release team, and uh, previously contributed to Service Catalog. My name's uh, Dave Strabel. So I'm a cloud native architect at Microsoft. Uh, I work on the Azure Global Black Belt team. Uh, we essentially help customers implement Kubernetes on Azure. Uh, I've also worked on the release team uh, for quite a few releases. Uh, recently authored a Kubernetes best practice book uh, by O'Reilly. And my favorite dinosaur is also a T-Rex. And partially because of little hands and I don't like paying for bills. So I get T-Rex hands when I got to get my wallet out. A lot of T-Rex fans here. All right, if you didn't mention your favorite dinosaur, when we get to you in a question, you have to mention your favorite dinosaur. Um, and uh, Dave, toss a link to your book into the chat so people have it. That'd be awesome if people want to check that out. Um, all right, let's go over how this is going to work. Um, so first of all, this is a judgment-free zone. Everyone had to start from somewhere. Uh, we have experts here, but we have people just getting started. Um, we like to we like to think of the office hours channel as kind of like the safe zone for you to ask any kind of dumb question. Part of the reason I started this show was I had to learn Kubernetes myself, so why not do it together um, and use all these fine people here, use their knowledge to our advantage and share it with everybody so we can keep that ball rolling. While we will do our best to answer your questions, the panel doesn't have access to your cluster. So live debugging questions are going to be uh, off topic. Uh, especially those of you on-prem with networking, it just gets like really complicated and difficult. Uh, so what we will try to do is in cases like that, maybe try to teach you best concepts or places where you can find uh, maybe in a certain log or something where you can find the problem to help you at least get moving forward a little bit. Uh, so those questions will be off topic. Panelists, you're encouraged to expand on your answers with your experience and pro tips. Uh, 
while it would be awesome to listen to you recite the Kubernetes docs back to me, uh, the real value is the experience you get in the field and messing with the software on a day-to-day -day basis. So all that goody, all the SRE goodness, we want all of that stuff. Um, audience, you can help us out by pasting URLs to the official docs, blogs, or anything that might be relevant to the topic at hand. One of my favorite parts about the show is almost every single session, someone we're talking about something and someone pastes in a new URL for a tool that we didn't know existed. Uh, and sharing that information is very valuable. So if there's anything, blog posts, things of that nature um, that are useful for the community, whack them in there. What we do is collect them all in the two sessions and then I publish them all as show notes uh, so that people can have all these links and it's really handy to kind of review. And while you're watching the show too, it's nice to have the URLs there uh, so you can check out the stuff that people are talking about. Uh, let's see, you can post your questions on discuss.kubernetes.io, our forum, and give us the link. You can uh, give us a pre-made Stack Overflow question, or you can just ask directly in the Slack channel. That's also fine. What we do is we throw all these into a working document, um, and then we just read, I read them top to bottom. Um, so uh, when I ask for questions, feel free to just start putting them in the chat. If you have a question now, just do question colon. So it's easy for us to determine where it is and ask your questions. Feel free to start queuing them up as, as we go. And then we're going to try to get through as many of them as possible. This panel is made entirely of volunteers. So if you want to rotate in, please let us know. It's a great way to get back to the community. Uh, I like to watch to see who's helping people the most and ask them to, to come onto the panel. That's where Pierre came from. So uh, he was chatting a lot uh, in the, in the, in the chat, we just ask them, hey, you know, it might be easier if you just explain explain this to us. Um, and lastly, we're DevOps people too. So we like to measure our metrics to see how we're doing. So subscribing, liking, sharing a tweet, retweeting. Um, I, I monitor all that stuff that, it, that helps me figure out how many sessions we're going to do, um, how many volunteers I need, resources that are need. Uh, we do have documentation so that if people in other time zones wanna give this a shot, you have instructions on how to do this and things like that. Um, but it, it is nice to be able to ask for a t-shirt budget uh, when I have the numbers of all the viewers listening uh, to make that a, a, a easy sell for people. So with that, before we get started, I want to thank the following companies for supporting this community with developer volunteers, Giant Swarm, StockX, Pivotal, Pusher.com, Weaveworks, VMware, University of Michigan, Red Hat, Spectrum, Io, American Airlines, and Utility Warehouse. And as always, a special thanks to the CNCF for sponsoring our t-shirt giveaway. And with that panel, are we ready? Monica, did you decide on a favorite dinosaur yet? Uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna go with pterodactyl because they can fly. So if I were gonna be any kind of dinosaur, I'd wanna be able to fly. Okay, okay. <sighs> All right. With that, we're gonna go with our first question from Amir. If you're here, Amir, please let us know, but this is a holdover. We ran out of time in the morning session. Um, but I figured this is a general question to start off with the panel. The rest of you, please keep uh, typing your questions in and we will get to them. So Amir asks, we are soon going to scale up our microservice. That means going from local Minikube cluster to bigger clouds where our service could be deployed on demand, but the service might crash due to several issues. Just wondering if there's some good tips on how to prepare for troubleshooting of crashed microservices, log collections, et cetera. Load test, load test, load test, run load test against your application. You will find that if you put something in a dev environment and you load test it, things will shake out before you get it to prod. So I would strongly suggest putting like load test control planes and load trust, uh, load test control workers in there. I see slightly nodding heads. Any other opinions? I'm a huge fan of iteration. I mean, so as you're going through and, and trying to prepare, like you said, load testing, like just iterate and you can do benchmarks. So if you're going through, make sure you understand like where you're maxing out and, you know, you don't want to go straight from, you know, one to a thousand. So kind of go along, you know, the different intervals there, pick your, 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 whatever your limits are, and then make note of it. So you can kind of compare like, you know, how it's looking along the way. Um, so what I learned is basically to have my monitoring outside of my Kubernetes clusters. Um, I kind of established this infrastructure where I have one Prometheus per cluster, and then I federate this up to another monitoring cluster just to make sure I can access it if my cluster goes down. Um, so. 
that's just a fantastic idea overall. Yeah. <laughs> Not uh, many people are doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, this question I actually got from Reddit, and I knew Dave was sorry, and I knew Dave was going to be here, so I saved a Windows question here. Um, oh. I'm, 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 so we actually have run a Windows uh, specific office hours, and this is something uh, everyone will look forward in the future. We are going to we're going to try to expand to kind of have topic based office hours. Uh, so that should be a lot of fun. Uh, so the question from Reddit: I'm building my container lab today. I'm planning for three nodes, two workers, and a master. Question: Can all these VMs run Windows Server? We're a Microsoft shop, and we're planning on start with converting existing .NET framework apps to containers, then rewrite apps on .NET Core. Any help would be appreciated. And then I'm going to add a little bit of uh, extra sub question here for you, Dave. If you could share any expertise, I, I'm sure that there are Windows shops that are just like pure Windows shops and might not have like the expertise to like, oh no, I have to set up a cluster. So, you know, any insight you can give? Yeah, and I'll, I'll going to that new world of .NET Core and all the all the good stuff. I'll preface it with I haven't used Windows in about 12, 15 years, uh -huh. uh, uh, and because I work at Microsoft, everybody thinks I know Windows. Yeah, but uh, I will say what I know here, and I believe I responded on Reddit to that actual mm -hmm. question. But yeah, your control plane still has to run uh, within the context of Linux. Uh, your worker nodes will run Windows, but you still have to have a control plane that's built uh, around Linux. Mm -hmm. All right. I, you know, at some point, I'm going to meet a Microsoft person that actually uses Windows. I have not yet. <laughs> I, have not, I know. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I was at Microsoft before VMware, and I also didn't use Windows. Oh. Uh, does anybody have anybody actually in chat also, anyone have great... Uh, any Windows experience here that might want to give them a tip? I see someone's typing. We'll let people type there. Uh, and then we will move on. John McGowan, thanks for joining the show, says, I ran into something yesterday and I posted it on r slash Kubernetes, which is the Kubernetes subreddit. Perhaps someone can look at it and talk about it at office hours. Oh, I should actually probably just open the question and read that. So, yeah, it's pretty uh, <laughs> long. Um, oh, boy. OK. Uh, uh, yeah. I think, yeah, the, what does it say? It says unexpected rebalancing with WebSocket connections flowing to the Nginx service. Uh -huh. So here's how his setup is. His setup is like deployment web service with number of parts, with X number of parts. And his service is fronted by Ingress, uh, which is the Ingress Nginx controller. And his parts are running a graph SQL service. Clients have running, long running WebSocket connections. Mm -hmm. So the behavior does something like this. It says uh, if the list of endpoints on the service change from typically pod activity, like scaling in and out, number of pod in deployment, and continue failing readiness check. So he is not sure what to look at it, but he would expect the following. For instance, when a new pod is started in a deployment, that the new pod would be available for new connections, but the existing long running WebSocket connections to previously running pods would just persist. So this is the overall issue what he posted it, but yeah, I mean, if anyone for it, but uh, I see that uh, someone posted about session stickiness Yep, would be the good one for this one. If, yeah, is someone up for this question? And I know it's a long one. Uh, has anybody read this? Read. Yeah. We'll it give it a second here. Yeah, yes. So uh, John McGowan was saying the issue is that when the list of endpoints change. Change. I mean, I would have expected that Kubernetes actually keeps the connections open and does not disrupt the connection. Um, I've, not, I've run WebSocket and it didn't terminate the connection. So I'm not okay. sure what the issue is here. Yeah, he's saying the issue is that when the list of endpoints change, all the connections are severed across all pods. Yeah. Josh Burkus replied in the thread to the original question post and said that this sounds vaguely like an issue that was recently fixed with endpoints. Interesting. Yeah, he says even the ones that are totally healthy. Let's see. Um, did he link to an issue? Also, Josh, if you're listening, was, welcome. Starting to look for that right now. Yep. Hold on, let's see what people are thinking. 
Yeah, so even if the healthy ones are being severed. What version of Nginx? Yeah, that may be the good one. So it may be the latest version, 70, or what version is that? Uh, he's not giving a version, but he's in the chat, so. Yeah, then let's give him time. Yep. Any other thoughts on this? So here's here's how we do with long standing questions is um, we will address it and then we'll give some people some time in the background to uh, gather information and then we'll come back to it. Um, yep, off the top of my head, he's on 1.4 ish and older Kate is 1.12 ish. So uh, can you move Samuel Dharma? There we go. Got you. Okay. Um, 1.4 for the Nginx controller. Okay, so uh, if let's keep following up with them on Slack. Uh, we'll continue going with some questions and then we'll come back and address this as the show goes while they get the details. Thanks, John, uh, for being patient and we will we will get back to you here. Jake Cowton says, chiming in from the UK, yay. I hear Minikube mentioned a lot when it comes to local testing. Is MicroKates actually a viable alternative? And is there anything else you can recommend for helping with local testing? I have a feeling I know the answers to this, but I will let the panel go first. I'm a huge fan of Kind now. I uh, have not used Minikube in quite a while now. Um, pretty much only using Kind for most of my local stuff. It's really awesome. Um, it's much more reliable than I found Minikube to be over the last few releases. And it's pretty lightweight. Uh, I was using the built-in Kubernetes stuff in Docker for Mac, like the Docker desktop application for a while. Uh, but I, I just feel like Kind is so much better um, to use. I'm a huge plus one on that. Sorry, go Monica. No, I was just, I was going to add on to, I'm a huge fan of Kind now. I think when I first started using it, I was so blown away after using both um, Minikube and MicroKate. So like, I mean, I'll run my own test for Prometheus or something. And I found it super easy to customize and put up like more than, you know, multiple workers and, you know, do some Valero testing or different things like that. So um, it was, it was great. So I'm a huge fan of Kind. One of the yeah, things that I love about it was the built-in, uh, the ability for built-in testing against a version. So I can pull in the 1.18 version, and I can run a set of a set of conformance tests that are already built in to test something, and maybe my application uh, with that. So that's like huge for me and for the development teams. Yeah, for us, for example, we test against the next version. So we use test against the current version as the next Kubernetes version. So we are better on a better side. So it actually is quite nice with kinds to do these kinds of things. The, yeah, the other thing with my it doesn't need a VM for it to run. It runs locally. So like now on Max, is there a VM? It, there's a VM in there somewhere, right? Is it eventually using Docker desktop or whatever you have installed? Okay, just curious. Because I run on Linux, it's just fast. <laughs> it's like... You can use remote Docker hosts, which makes your Mac mm. also quite fast. Um... Mm. When I was setting up testing, I have a Mac, but I actually also have a, a Linux VM machine. So that I do all my work with now. And just, I think I ran kind on both and just the getting everything running on like on kind on Linux was super fast. Dave, any opinions on local tools? Uh, I agree with all points here. Yeah. Uh, I use kind also. Yep. And then the last bit, my favorite part about kind, they have a channel in the Kubernetes Slack and they're very helpful. And it's just the maintainers are very responsive on issues and things like that. And you could say that too about MicroKates and K3S as well. But the kind folks really do go out of their way to help people. And I just love that. Um, it just makes everything so much nicer. Um, all right. There's a follow up question on that. Sure. There's a follow up question on that. There's a how is the storage volume support for the kind? How does what? How does the storage volume support uh, for the kind? Oh, okay. Storage volume support for kind. Do we know offhand? Since I do local development, it's I'm doing like local storage. Yeah, same. I'll see if we can find any docs on uh, on that though. Follow up. Yeah. Could you like could you like NFS a kind thing? Like if you have an NFS thing on your network already. Like do an NFS volume? We were talking about NFS earlier today. Just curious. 
And I don't know how it works with the local, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you're running it locally, I don't know how it works as an NFS. But the local, any other local network mapping drive or something like does that treating it as an NFS share? Yeah, interesting. Okay, well, thanks, Jake, for your question. Everyone, stick around because we do raffle off T-shirts at the end of the show if we've asked your question. Next question is for Jim Angel. Samuel Drama, you wanna you wanna MC this one? Yes, let me get to that question. Uh, yeah, the Jim, uh, right from the Jimming. Uh, the question is, any GitHub horror stories, lessons learned, or strange pitfalls? For example, I'm running into strange things with order of operations, like deploying the CRDs, operators. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good question. I think anyone, yeah, most of them will have a lot of stories around it, around the GitHubs. Panel, I know we mentioned Anybody? Argo this yeah. morning, I believe. So um, in regards with CRDs and operators, um, so I'm a huge fan of Helm. I'm using Helm a lot. And I um, think the Helm file tool is quite nice. Um, it actually allows, allows you to orchestrate your um, Helm charts. And it also allows you to execute certain things before others and also have that all in one repository. So um, that's how I do it. I just have like a repository and they are, are executed alphabetically and I don't have any issues with um, order of operations. Oh so, yeah, that's it. And uh, yeah, that that will that to the point. Yes, Helm is I think it's the mostly used for app deployments and hardware and everything. But yeah, anybody? Any other tools? Any other tools uh, in the panel uh, that they can think of the GitOps? Any lessons learned or any issues that you've faced? I'll say the biggest thing I've found is understand how you're going to structure your Git repositories, uh, whether you're doing directory based versus branch based uh, type stuff. Uh, the branch base can get you into really weird situations where there's, you know, some, tra it, both approaches have a lot of different trade-offs. One thing that I'd recommend is looking in the GitOps channel and the Kubernetes Slack. There's a lot of people have been using the different patterns for a while. Uh, and I always found it, they're very helpful in that channel. So I would definitely check there to uh, hear kind of end users, uh, you know, use cases and stories uh, implementing GitOps. Nice. I think there is, uh, yeah, in the Slack, there is someone also said that I'm currently setting up a CRD with conversion webhook. Oh, that, that was a question, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so was, Mojus, yeah. Uh, we'll get to that question here in a bit. We got a few yeah, Sorry, I thought, yeah, I thought it was a CRD, so I thought it was a rest. Yeah. So, sorry. No worries, no worries. So um, it looks like John has also started a thread on their question there. And I see Aaron Eaton engaging there. Thanks for that. So let's let's for John's question here. He's got uh, he's got a thread here that he just posted at 1223 there. And okay, we are moving on to the next question is from Taylor. They said I have a service defined here and I'll plop I'll plot this little GitHub link here. Um, how is this actually targeting a deployment? It doesn't appear to have a selector. Just give everyone time to look at that file. Looks like Josh has been replying inside of a thread on that one. Okay. Uh, any anything you can gleam that you could share with us? Let me scroll back to the top. Yeah. Uh, it says the selector gets injected later by Patroni. Uh, it's a post, Postgres-based load balancing tool, and it works partly by, by manipulating services and endpoints. Um, and he says it's direct injection. That's what Petroni does for the timescale master. Uh, you can actually deliberately create, create an endpoint object, and that's what uh, Petroni is doing. Okay. 
uh, like snow selector is creating endpoints for that automatically, like the actual endpoint objects. Yeah, and if you, if you have Burkus responding to your question, you're that he's pretty much the expert when it comes yeah. to databases. So, okay, uh, let let Taylor let us know how that goes. Um, uh, we are uh, Bill Wood asked a question that's like way too general, so like I don't want to spend too much time on it. Question: Anthos Tanzu Ranger question mark. Any opinions here? Okay, I'll go with the opinion. Um, there's Kubernetes and there's a lot of stuff that's Kubernetes and a bunch of other stuff that's way too complicated to cover here. Um, so, you know, you're not just getting Kubernetes when you do Anthos, Tanzu, and Rancher, you're getting a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so this is like really way too complicated and way too generalized. Um, these yeah, more, because these it's, 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 yeah. Yeah. It, because it includes your IAS patch and everything with the Kubernetes in, 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 involved in everything. Because yeah. there's a new there's a new tool that coming up with us complete pass solution. So I think there's a yeah. lot of things which that goes into that question. So yeah, yeah, that's uh, a, a a big question, and it's not really fair for me to answer. So <laughs> yeah, it's like I can't. I work on I work on this. I can't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so similar to like when people ask what public cloud should I use, it's like uh. <laughs> so uh. Uh, sorry, Bill, but uh, ho hopefully uh, you'll know how to how to find that research. Uh, figure figure that out. Um, Bray asks, "Oh, you want to take this next one?" Sure. So there you go. Yeah, Bray. the Bray asks. Bray? Yeah. Yeah, Bray Gilson. Yeah, the Bray Gilson. Uh, his question is something like this: I am looking at building my first cluster and have a background in AWS. And struggling with what software to use to do that. EKS versus KOps versus Cube Spray. Do you have any suggestions of what works well together or any bad experiences with something? Yes. So the annual installer question. Uh, let's just go around the room. <laughs> I have feels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to tell you my opinion, having gone through this, uh, but this might not be what you should do. I don't particularly like using EKS because I do not know what is happening under the hood to my cluster. And I like the control from an application perspective. I do deploy clusters on AWS using COPS because I can control that. And that's my answer. And I'm sorry if I offended anyone. I'll, I'll piggyback off of that. And uh, I, think, so I think Monica was responding in thread to that. And I think the, the real salient point there is, it depends on what you're looking for. Do you just want Kubernetes that's gonna run and someone's managing it for you? Like EKS is okay for that. Uh, do you want to have a lot of control over what you're doing um, in terms of versions that you're deploying or think like, do you wanna patch images? Like for example, we're doing a FedRAMP audit right now for service that I work on and we use COPS and we needed to go patch a bunch of images uh, to make that like to pass um, FedRAMP scans. And like COPS gives you a lot more control over what you're going to do and like, what you're going to deploy. And it's been pretty nice for us. Um, for uh, in my previous life at Microsoft, like AKS was awesome because I could just spin up a cluster to test what I needed. I wasn't really concerned with the operations of the cluster. I was just deploying my application. And all I needed was the app to run uh, using Kubernetes and like some cloud services. So in that case, the managed service makes a lot more sense. Uh, and EKS may give you that if that's what you're looking for at AWS. Oh yeah, that was very that was very good answer. I think uh, because yeah, those are all the things that depends on how you want to manage it, right? So whether if you want to be managed uh, with the master, as Monica mentioned in the Slack, or she, I think she already answered a couple of the questions uh, there. I can post it there. Yes, if you want to really manage the cluster with the master nodes and everything, uh, try to go with kind of that kind of cluster. Whereas in the cloud, like EKS, AKS. There, you don't manage your master. All you're managing is just your workloads and you're deploying your applications there. So I think, yeah, I think Monica's already got to the point where, yeah, he said, thanks, this is a very helpful uh, 
Yeah, yeah I've, I've been putting in there. Um, so we, like everybody else said, seconds, all that. And, and it's also a budget issue, right? I mean, if you've got all the money in the world, like sure, go to manage service with EKS or whatever. And that's probably your fastest thing. And, and you're going to have, you know, the least control over it. I've got that background where I want to know what's going on. I want access. Like it's bizarre to me to not get into a server or something. So um, I like that. I do like Terraform and Kubadium. Yes, I have totally focused on myself and broken things horribly, um, but I'm, you know, still using it and learning and, and I love it. So that's that's my favorite. I haven't used COPS, Coopsprite, or EKS like within the past year. So I, I don't want to comment too much on like how what the state of those are right now. I think there's been tons of improvements with COPS and Coopsprite. When I was first setting up clusters, um, I mean, Kubadium wasn't really out there like it was still beta so we had to do all kinds of really ugly things to get a kubernetes cluster running um so i am super happy to have terraform and kubadm now yeah uh we talked about that this morning when people were mentioning keeps right having all these tools kind of rally around cube admin has really made a lot of bugs go away first of all but like usually when when i asked people i was like look you're evaluating these tools and something the one thing i always you know remember is is that tool kind of talking to the SIG responsible for the entire cluster lifecycle? And in cases of like COPS and cube spray and stuff, they are. So that just gives me a little bit more confidence, you know, that upstream is kind of like supporting this thing. Um, John mentioned a good tip, which I thought was interesting. Uh, he says, I've been happy using Rancher as a very thin layer just to provision mostly vanilla clusters. I avoid all the things they try to give you so I have more control over them. For instance, I turn off the ingress option, but then install that myself with help which I think is an interesting way to do it. So that is an option. Uh, anybody, anybody else have uh, opinions on this? Uh, so I'll make one point since mm -hmm. I work for a uh, vendor that provides managed Kubernetes. I would say managed Kubernetes is great to, like if you're just getting your feet wet and getting started with your Kubernetes deployment, it can be great. It takes off some of the operational burden. But I think once you get more experience with Kubernetes, you start doing more complex things, you kind of, it's kind of nice knowing what's going on behind the scenes and having some more control over that. Mm -hmm. um, so I can also add some information. Like I came all over the world where we use managed Kubernetes and then I also kind of shifted into self-managed Kubernetes. And uh, so the learning curve is still quite steep. So if you want to get started now, a managed service might be what you want to have, but if you have time and can invest the resources into learning um, how to manage Kubernetes yourself, it's definitely worth it. I'd also like to thank the panel for not mentioning Kubernetes the hard way. So someday we'll get past that. <laughs> All right, moving on. Maria A asks, welcome Maria. Is there a programmatic way to feed a pod status into the scheduler and have it react conditionally according to it? Uh, example, we have pods running user jobs. These jobs can't be abruptly interrupted or data will be lost. We would like to be able to tell Kubernetes from the pod, hey, this pod is running a job. Don't kill it or don't interrupt it. Or if this pod status equals claimed by a user, migrate it to XYZ node. Why are the pods getting killed? Um, that would be nice to know because usually it should not die, right? Right. So I'm wondering if this is one of the cases where they're scheduling things in pods that should be scheduled like as like cron or bot batch jobs or something, right? Yeah. Because that gives it a different. Uh, yeah, there are two things, right? So one is data is being lost. I'm like, I'm confused because the data should not be residing in the pod, right? So it should be somewhere now outside, the, I think somewhere and how would the pod it shouldn't be it shouldn't be like as soon as a pod goes it should come up again uh, but yeah the, as, the first thing is why is the pod like is it with the metrics there's a i mean the cpu or memory that's not available mm -hmm. that is going down or what is the reason for it to abruptly interrupt so something in the box first needs to be verified yeah maria if you're listening we would love so more information she just wrote in the thread um, that, yep, it's a bad job. So I will just post that in the Slack again. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. She just mentioned it's a bad job, yes. So that definitely shouldn't be happening then, right? As far yes. as I know. 
I mean, it's not intended behavior for that to happen when it's a batch job, right? How how do you start the uh, the process of like claiming it for a user? Like, are you deploying it or like scheduling it when there's work to do, or is it still running in the background? Hmm. I'm going to give her time to type. Let me just give everyone a quick status on John McGowan's question. According to this thread, uh, hold on, let me look at it. I want to make sure I thank the right people here. And I, love, I swear threads are the greatest and worst things to happen to Slack at the same time. So um, Maria said, yes, it's a batch. That was it for that thread. Yeah, so for John's thread, Manuel uh, Alejandro de Vitro Fontes, that's a great name, uh, is recommending the, to upgrade to the latest version of Ingress Engine X. Um, first of all, everything older than 0.25.1 is affected by several CVEs, but uh, there's actually a, a, an issue here in the change notes that's like, hey, ensure that we're not uh, killing all the endpoints when endpoints are reloaded. So it looks like that is just an issue of upgrading to the latest version of Engine X. Uh, so John, I hope that uh, that points you in the right direction and fixes your problem. Uh, Kenzie wants to add for this one for Maria, it sounds like a case of a custom controller for me, to me. Yeah, and then from Maria, I think she, she mentioned again in the Slack that the pod is alive and in unclaimed state, then matches a job and switches status to claimed in this case. The mm -hmm. pod becomes critical and we need to make sure it will not be south. Yeah. So Jeff was on earlier. He's kind of our batch expert. Um, so I don't, I don't know if I'd be worth pinging him on this one. Uh, Maria, if you stick around after we go, I, I have a, I have actually, one of our panelists is a batch expert uh, that they just don't happen to come to this session. Um, so worst case, I will connect you with Jeff afterwards. Is there any other information or anything that we can ask from her that might help sort this? Okay, we'll just let that thread develop and, and worst case, I'll send, I'll send someone for you. <laughs> um, Okay, moving on while that's while that's developing here. Alex Nutting asks, hi everyone, my team is finally has a Kubernetes cluster up and running, yay. And we're starting the process of migrating apps to run on Kubernetes. Can anyone provide tips for adding secret files like SSL certs into running pods and containers? I'll go. <laughs> I was like, don't everyone jump in at once. <laughs> uh, it's probably stated quite a few times is uh, using something like Vault uh, has direct integration into that. Uh, I've found that has been pretty solid uh, to use. Uh, but that being said, there is a lot of different ways you could go with doing that. Yeah, depending yeah, on where you're it, hosting your environment, yeah. uh, you know, Vault is probably one of the most widely used ways, but there's also like, if you're running on an AWS environment, there's, I think it's like a KMS you can do secrets on. Uh, that's another good way. Uh, GCP has different ways you can do it. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it depends on the where you're hosting it, right? So if it is like cloud providers, you have like uh, the walls which you can directly use it, or if it is on-prem or if it is on local, uh, it's like any native tools like CyberArk or any other tools which your uh, enterprise provides, or uh, it may be like by default the Kubernetes secrets. It's just the Kubernetes secrets. Just store your search and just configure and use it. So that's that's what I think. But uh, are there any other uh, things and options? No, I. 
I love Vault as well. Um, just don't leave your secrets around in YAML files. Just please don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, that was a good tip, yes, because I see some of them just writing this secrets in the YAML and just writing deploy. Are there any other alternatives? I only I only ever see people recommending Vault. Is it pretty much a solved problem at this point? Just the best practice? I, I guess it's the best practice. Um, you could also like how, depending on how much you trust your pipelines, you could put your secrets in the pipelines and deploy them via Terraform, for example. I'm not saying I'm promoting this or I say it's a good idea but it works. And uh, if your storage and your pipelines are secure, it's something you can do. It's something that I have done before, but it's not like yeah. that I say, do it this way. I'd also say, um, what is it? Bitnami sealed secret, especially if you're wow. using more of a GitOps approach, uh, you may have to approach that differently. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of people using uh, sealed secrets too. Yeah, Joe mentioned sealed secrets as well. It's the same concept as Puppet Hira, if anyone is familiar. I'm not. I've also seen people use GPG secrets and then they use black box to decrypt and encrypt secrets, if anybody's seen that. And I see Kenzie uh, also on the Slack said that there's a sidecar integration for Vault HashiCorp from HashiCorp. Yep, and Aaron Eaton also yeah. mentions, yeah, Kubernetes has integration with all for secrets as they have similar native integration with AWS secrets manager or KMS slash SSM parameter store. What non-vault secret backends have people used? That's an interesting question. So from a, from a, I want to keep everything kind of neutral running your own vault kind of makes sense, but I'm sure there's plenty of people with use cases that just want to use what their cloud provides. So do we have a TLDR and on how people are doing secrets. How's it working at Azure, Dave? Just curious. Uh, Azure also has a key vault integration. So customers I see, uh, depending if they've already have vault deployed, they'll typically use vault, but if they want to use something built into a cloud provider, uh, Azure has, you know, same type of integration. Uh, they've uh, Redesign also has done the CSI uh, driver for secrets. Yeah, I was uh, just going to drop a link to that. Uh, which supports multiple different backends, one being Azure, one being Vault. Uh, there may be more there now. I haven't looked at it in a little while. But, but probably all the ones that you would actually want to use in real life would have a CSI driver. Yes, right? correct. Okay. Yeah, so you could use that as your filter to, to <laughs> right. Okay. Um, and Amit would like to point out Kubernetes external secrets allow you to use external secret management system like AWS Secrets Manager or Vault securely. And there's a link there that appears to come from GoDaddy. That's cool. I didn't know that was a thing. All right. Anything else secrets tools wise before we move on? So Mosh is, uh, has a question and it is long. So I'm going to, I think I'm just going to repost it in the chat here. And by the time you repost, let me start reading it. Yeah. You, do you want to, you want to try this one? This one yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> try, try, try to try to break it yeah, down so you're not reading. Yeah. yeah, don't don't read any of the dashes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the question is a big, but yeah, it's a bit big. Yeah, it says I'm currently setting up a CRD with conversion webhook. While setting up the SSL part, I created a cert for my webhook service using the built-in CSR mechanism which to my understanding is using the K, the Kubernetes CA to sign the CSR. Then on the CA bundle section of the CRD conversion stanza, I would have expected that by not specifying it and letting it default to the built-in CA, it will work. However, it didn't and I had to actually get the API server CA using kubectl get config map in order to pull a CA and specify it manually in my CRD conversion stanza. 
so he was just curious to see did he is did missing anything in this process or is this something he didn't understand correctly or uh, is this is any info missing in the question he says he can provide it but yeah as i understand is that like so yeah, I, can we try to rephrase this sure trying to rephrase that, yes yeah so, Mash is if you're online start typing yeah sorry go ahead <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a big question. Sorry if I am like preferring so, since reading it. No, no, it's it's not you. I think um, the expected outcome would have been to use CCA from that it has Kubernetes built in, but it didn't. And now the question is how he could have, like, should it have been the default or is he doing something wrong? Like, it's what I understood out of it. Any comments here? It's going to have to be one of you because I have no idea what's going on with this one. <laughs> I, I have no idea. Yeah. I'm hoping he can rephrase it a little bit better. Yeah. And it's not that he maybe rephrased it wrong. I just, something feels like it's being lost in translation. That could totally be me. Mm. Other typing. Jim's got some, some, information there on how certificates work, blog post. So to give a bit more context, that CRD is applied across multiple clusters and I don't want to have to run the same set of steps on every cluster, specifically on the CA bundle section. So it's a multi-cluster question. Yeah. So initially he's, uh, you're all watching chat. Okay, good. Yeah, I think someone uh, like Strong Mure has suggested that it says, he sees that I like Jenkins approach with preview environment. And uh, yeah, okay. people are commenting on it, but yeah, the Joel, uh, I see that Joel also said that I think cert managers solve this problem in a quiet and neat way. We'll go have a look. Okay, yeah, Joel. I, I agree that uh, cert manager would solve this problem. We, we, we're we we're counting on you because the rest of us are kind of like blanking out here. Okay, well, let's give Joel some time there to do it. Let me move on to our next multi-part complicated question, but I'll try to break this one in down into, into uh, sections here. Uh, and Dracy asks, I'm running Jenkins in a Kubernetes cluster. All the worker nodes are spot instances. Sweet. Meaning to say that all the builds Jenkins slaves are running on them. It was working fine, mostly uh, for a year, but all of a sudden deploys are starting to get failure due to no route to host issues. And then uh, there's an error, which uh, I, will, I will find in the original post so that you can read it. Um, basically, it cannot connect to another Kubernetes cluster to do a kubectl set image. Jenkins and other Kubernetes clusters are peered. I've restarted and checked kubedns pods and kubedns mass container. Nothing in the logs that can explain the issue. Restarting etcd or weave does not help. The issue resolves by terminating the instance and replacing it. The deploy running fine for, runs fine when there are new instances. Please point me in the right direction. Uh, like what could be the issue after replacing the worker? Oh, okay. Then at the very end, it looks like Bob fixed the issue. So let's just go. I should have started with that. Uh, let's just have a look here real quick. One second. I, I just want to make sure that we read the, uh, the solution online. And we're going to have to come up with a better threading system for next time because this is um, kind of not manageable. So I'm not sure if there's already um, an answer, like yeah. or a solution is there. I yeah, just saw I that Maki, right. yes, that that Maki started yeah. responding. So yeah. yeah, so I don't know that Bob. I think that might that might be in the hack and be is incorrect to that. Uh, oh, okay, all right, I'll delete that. That was yeah. all. So here's what I think the issue is: the way Jenkins works and the way it works in Kubernetes is there's a jar, and it's a Java jar, and the Java jar is a remoting agent. It's called a JNL, JNLP. That connection is the remoting that allows a control plane to talk with the actual 
workers where those spot intents are being created, that's being severed somehow. And as we were thinking through this in, in that uh, thread, I started to think if you are listening, Andre C., uh, I gave you a link to, or uh, not a link, I gave you a way to go into Jenkins and create a new log file. And that log file will pull your Kubernetes information from in Jenkins. What that may show you is once you do that and you set it to all, I'm the maintainer of this plugin, so I actually know a little <laughs> bit about it. Once you set that to all, I have a feeling you're going to see that there's async resource issues. What async resource issues are is in a Jenkins worker, when that gets full, it leaves a thread, a Java thread open. When that Java thread stays open, it tries to sync those resources every, I think it's every three minutes and it does it in intervals of five. And then it says something's wrong, I'm gonna sever the jar. The jar is the JNLP, which is where your worker is. I think if you, look at those logs, you're going to see that it's called async resource disposer. You'll see that that's showing errors. If that's showing errors, you then got to dig into those uh, those spot instances, leave one up. If you can SSH into it and go into the workspace, there will be a file that'll be a hex number followed by underscore WG. In that file will be the logs that it could not resource dispose. Uh, I'm almost about 90% sure that's your problem. That could be the most detailed, educated guess I think we've ever had on the show. So I, I am very interested to see if this is it. Yeah. I get people that open this issue quite often with me yeah. as well as in another plugin that I maintain. Uh, and what I'm finding is the async resource uh, disposal is not happening. That interferes with that remoting uh capability from Jenkins to that worker mm -hmm. and it severs the connection. Now, what happens also, just to add one more thing, is when mm -hmm. that connection is severed, it is not brought back up. So there's no ability to go back and say, oh, I lost my connection, bring that thread back up. That's why it works once you reboot or restart the node as you, uh, Andre C, as you explained, that's why it comes back up because you've restarted that jar. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So. Andre, let us know how that works. If if he, if you are correct, then I will buy you a beer on Andre's behalf just because you just guessed that. If that is indeed the case, um, okay. Any, any 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 other comments on this one? Okay, no worries. I think that was a most detailed. Like, yeah, I think that was a most detailed explanation. <laughs> All right, so we are running out of time, so we're going to try to bat. Right. We're going to try to ha hash through these next few questions, and then we'll give away the T-shirts. Yeah. So Neil Key asks questions. I got an old one about eleven cluster, and I'm working on upgrading, but I'm encountering a throttling issue right now. The HPA is set to CPU usage, and currently using Nginx in Ingress uh, test one gradually increased traffic, and HPA node scaler works as intended. Test two hit the service with a thousand calls per second and we just get a bunch of drop calls and scaling doesn't scale out to handle the traffic. I'm hoping upgrading to 1.17 and introducing a custom metric for calls and ingress instead of CPU usage will fix this. Have you encountered anything like this before? I don't want to default to if you upgrade the latest version, everything will be PG. Because that's like our crutch. <laughs> Although it seemed to work out for John <laughs> earlier today, I guess. Any opinions on this? I have an opinion, but I can't say. I would say to look, if you do some searching and I don't have it readily available at my fingertips, if you look at some searching for a one dot, I believe it's version 1.10 and 1.11 for the plague PLEG issue, you may start to see some of your problems. I will say that I know of an instance where 1.10 and 1.11 were having what you're describing and upgrading it to 11.8 completely fixed the problem. It never happened again. I feel the underlying issue was regards to the PLEG, I call it the plague. Uh, you may start there and I'll find the link and post that, but that's just a guess on my part. Looks like Josh is typing. 
he might have the answer there. Any any other comments on this one? Yeah, I'm just he, thinking of the upgrade from one eleven to one seventeen. That like terrifies me a little bit. That's huge. I mean, that's just not happening. That's just get a new cluster and move on <laughs> if you can. Yeah, you're I mean, long, long due past support. Yeah, yeah. One eleven to one twelve and twelve to thirteen hurt me a lot personally. So I can't imagine going that far. And even doing incremental uh, was not great. So good. I'm glad it's going to an all new cluster. Then hopefully you don't see any of this stuff again. Yeah. Is this just one of those things where it's like you have a new cluster and then a bunch of issues, nagging issues go away kind of thing? Is that is that a common thing? Yeah, but you get a whole bunch of new ones, like new shiny issues. So, you know, it's uh I was about to ask new. I was about to ask you what the downside was. <laughs> you totally just told me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh final question before we get to the t-shirt rally. Uh, Angel Vera asks, how to collect Java core from a container that is running a Java app in the case where uh, there is an out of memory, is the E error, out of memory error, um, E, and the container was- Yeah, there. out of uh, exception or the out of memory exception of the errors. Oh, heap dumps out of a container are not a fun process. If you've ever had to do one, it is not fun. Uh, I actually have a link to something and I'll find it because I've had to do this numerous times but it's very involved. Any best practice? So people do ask the questions about Java um, and the um killer here actually is, are there any best practices you can share other than, you know, do it, the way try to do a good job to set your limits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that, and you know, the, depending on how your application is, the way you're setting your, for a Java application, especially the way you set your heap for that application is like, I can't stress doing that correctly because you can, the way GC works and you, it'll, it's not a fun experience. I have some links to a blog post that I wrote a while ago about Kubernetes and Java best practices that I mm -hmm. will link once I can find it. Okay, awesome. And with that, we are out of time. We're going to do the t-shirt raffle. It's our favorite part. Um, the way this works is I'll announce the two winners and then I'll PM you after. I'll give you a code. Um, you can go to store.cncfio and get a shirt. You get a free shirt. Or if you're listening out there and you just want some cool cloud native shirts, they have cool stuff for like all your favorite projects. So with that, uh, our winners, according to the internet's 12-sided die, Bill Wood, uh, you've won a Kubernetes t-shirt, and Maria A, you've won a covered Kubernetes t-shirt, so I will follow up with you. And with that, so uh, those of you that are listening the first time, we do this the third Wednesday of every month. Um, we are looking on ways to expanding this, maybe doing a networking edition, a storage one, things like that. So if you have any feedback on that, that always helps us. So if this is useful for now, good and bad feedback, we listen to all of it. Panelists, thank you so much uh, for for joining us. Anyone have anyone not say what their favorite dinosaur was? Marky, what's your favorite dinosaur? The small armed one. Sorry for the back. If you say Tyrannosaurus Rex, I swear to you. Okay, all right, fine. Everyone likes Tyrannosaurus Rex. All right. And with that, everybody, uh, I will be publishing the show notes here in about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, after I gather all the URLs. Thanks for joining us. Stick around in the channel. Feel free to hang out there the whole month. Queue up your questions for next month's edition. Uh, we, we like to keep the conversation going. Uh, shout out, very thanks those of you uh, in chat helping out other users and things like that. That's always helpful and we appreciate that. And with that, any last comments, panel? Last words? Anyone, anyone have a talk? Everybody. Anyone Thank have a talk at KubeCon that you want to, who's, any of you all speaking at KubeCon? Shut up. Want to have someone come to your talk or something? Um, as always, if you see me at KubeCon in Amsterdam, I always have swag on me. So if you listen to the show, just come grab me. I'll probably give you stuff. <laughs> and with that, thank you very much, panelists, for volunteering over half. Actually, each one of you, this is your very first time. All of you. We literally have no backups. Yes. That was literally the one thing I was like, make sure we go in with like having backups. And we did it. We just did it on our own. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dave, Monica, Marky, Jeremy, Pierre, and some drama. All right. With that, everyone have a great day and keep on uh, containerizing. Panel, stick around for a second.